a tension. A tension between grace and truth. Grace is not just the power to be saved. Grace is the power to change. Jesus is not just grace. He's grace and truth. We have churches that hold a standard, and you got to meet this standard, and this is God's standard. God is not just grace, and God is not just truth. He sent his word, and Jesus is full of grace and truth. He's full of forgiving you and accepting you like you are. But as he told the woman caught in the act of adultery, your sins are forgiven thee now. Go and sin no more. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and no one of you says to him, depart, and one of you says to him, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But some almost say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there's one God, you do well, but so what? Even demons believe that and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Verse 22, do you see that faith was working together with his works and by faith and by works, faith was made perfect. That's a powerful statement. <clears throat> you may not know it, but there's a great contention in the church across America right now. I can't speak for other parts of the world because I'm, I'm not well-traveled in world churches, but I'm very well-traveled in churches across America of every different kind of denomination and creed. And there's a tension, a tension between grace and truth. The Bible says, and we beheld his glory. The word became flesh, John chapter one, Jesus. The word in heaven became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld the glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We have basically taken aim and created two kinds of churches. We've got churches that are just grace, 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 grace. I, I think that I was just canceled on a network not too long ago, and it's probably because I lean to the side of truth and just don't preach grace all the time. There's some people say, don't judge me. They just want you to affirm anything they do. They want you to affirm any lifestyle they have. They want you to affirm anything that's going, and you just be gracious, and you just judge, don't judge, and be gracious, and don't judge. And now we have the, the grace churches. Just come like you are, and God loves you like you are, and I have no problem with either one of those two statements but let me tell you something that grace does grace never leaves you like you are grace always takes you and changes you grace is not just the power to be saved grace is the power to change and it is correct that salvation is free and you can take that gift and do anything you want to do with it if I give one of you a gift you can take that gift and go out tonight and be an axe murderer if you want to when it is a gift it's not a wage you didn't earn it it is a gift that I've given you salvation is the gift of God and there are people that mistreat it there are people that misuse it there are people that straight up abuse it but it is still no less a gift so what do you need to be saved it is by grace we have been saved through faith not of works lest any man should boast seems to contradict what I just read but it doesn't stay with me but truth is what flows out of grace. Jesus is not just grace. He's grace and truth. So we have truth churches. We have churches that hold a standard. And you got to meet this standard. And this is God's standard. 
And if you don't meet that standard, they tend not to welcome you. If you don't meet that tent standard, they tend to be maybe judgmental. And if you don't meet that standard, those churches can be somewhat legalistic and they can be known as rigid and they can know, be known by uh, operating by the leather of the letter of the law and not operating by grace. These are two different kind of churches with two different mindsets and they tend to be in contention with one another. And I'm here to hit this thing straight down the middle. God is not just grace and God is not just truth. He sent his word and Jesus is full of grace and truth. He's full of forgiving you and accepting you like you are. But as he told the woman called in the act of adultery, your sins are forgiven thee now. Go and sin no more. And we have the, we welcome you and your sins have been forgiven, but we've lacked the go and sin no more. Oh, we have the other side. Don't sin, don't sin, don't sin, but don't know what to do when a sinner comes in and who needs grace. I'm here to tell you the church is supposed to be both. We are supposed to allow anybody in that needs a touch from God. Jesus didn't come to save the righteous. He came to save sinners. He came to seek and save that was lost. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Jesus is not just the answer for people. Jesus is the answer for the whole world. Jesus can save the person, and after he saves the person, whoo, he can turn around and save their entire world. But at the same time, he is the God of righteousness. He is the God of justice. He is the God of truth. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but the word of God shall never pass away. And there is a standard of godliness, and he is my shepherd that leads me in paths of righteousness. Righteousness has a path. Righteousness has a lifestyle. So just like you've been touched by grace, grace has an overflow where it has touched my life and makes me want to conduct myself in a different way than before I met Jesus. I want different friends. I want a different environment. I want different activities. I want to put different things in front of my eyes. I want to put different things in my ears. I want to speak differently. I want to represent differently. Excuse me. Hallelujah. I know I ain't even got to my text yet, but does anybody hear what I'm talking about? Somebody shout grace and truth. Huh. Shout grace and truth. High five your neighbor and say this church is going to get them both right. Oh. <laughs> Blessed be his holy name. Thank you, Lord. So there's this tension. There's this tension. Let your neighbor say he's preaching good already while I get some water. Faith without works is dead. And James said, I will show you my faith by my works. He did not say that his uh, works save him. He said, but his faith there is a natural outer working of his faith that becomes his conduct, behavior, and his lifestyle. We are to accept anybody. Had someone call in on my riff, the, uh, excuse me, uh, text in on my riff the other night because uh, statistics are showing me most of my riff community who does the ask me anything are not Christians. In fact, I was the pers first person of faith on Rift. That's why they got me on there. And so they, they asked difficult questions. And a, a lady said, I'm, I'm a homosexual, and, but I feel lost and I've known God before. She said, am I welcome at your church? And I said, you are absolutely welcome at my church. I've never told anybody they couldn't come to the house of God. I said, and you come? I said, and I'm going to preach the word. And I said, and then you and God work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You come, that's grace. I want you here. Truth, I'm going to preach the word. And then the results are up to you and God. Grace, it's not one or the other. It's grace and truth. Faith without works is dead. Grace without truth Faith without works is dead. What does that word faith without works mean? <clears throat> Boy, this is a throwback. I think I preached this back in the 90s. Faith without a corresponding action 
is dead faith. It's hard to believe there's such a thing as dead faith. So faith without a corresponding action. Lord, we would like a house like that right there. Then go home as a corresponding action and start cleaning up your credit. Ooh, pastor, you like you had them shouting a minute ago, but you have lost that faith. That's good that you have set your faith on something and you want your family to live better than it's living right now because the Bible says that he who does not provide for his household is worse than an infidel. In other words, he who does not have a vision for his household is worse than an infidel. It's great that you want your family to increase. But now, what have you gone home and done about it? What works have you worked out of that faith? Well, I'm believing God to get me out of debt in 2023. Okay, you can't go put a Caribbean cruise on credit card because you don't have money. Because your faith and your works are contradicting each other. You Wise people can move from number one to number two. They know what God wants and they know how to set a course. For every vision, there is a vehicle. So what vehicle do you have to build to fulfill your purpose? Depending on the assignment on your life, things you get approached with might not be wrong, but are they wise for you to get involved in? In this teaching, Wisdom Society, Ron Carpenter will share with you how to gain knowledge beyond your years. See, God never calls you by what you are. God never calls you by what you used to be. That's people that do that. He comes in and speaks to your future, and that future begins to give you a framework of who you can be. Somebody shout if you know there's more. This series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now, and we will include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call 1-888-259-8200. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen. Daystar family, we are so blessed to be able to come into your home, wherever you are, if it's a hospital room, if it's a jail cell, if you're at work and you're listening with your earbuds on or wherever you are, we are so excited to be able to partner with you to get this gospel of Jesus Christ all over the world. You know, we haven't stopped the word. The word's coming, so don't get aggravated at that. It's just a time First to stop midstream and let us let you know how valuable you are to us. And uh, as you know, you hadn't seen a lot of ads. We haven't stopped for any commercials because we are viewer supported. And this is a time where we just want to let you know what's going on. Number one, I've been talking about the Wisdom Society. So good too. Wisdom so good. is the principal thing the Bible says, and in all thy getting, get understanding. All of, all of that is right there in Proverbs, and I have been spending weeks, weeks in this thing called the Wisdom Society. But you know what? On our online bookstore, if you visit it, you can get this entire series because I preach in series. Yeah. I don't preach kind of shotgun messages. I've always got a flow. We would love for you to have this if you've been blessed by any of these messages. And you know what else? We got to thank our covenant partners. Yes. You so know good. what? Those of you who help us do what we do, those of you who pray and those of you who sacrifice, and you have helped us get to where we are today. And it's not about personal achievement. It's about moving yes. the gospel of Jesus from local to state to regional to national to global yes. ears. You have helped us do that. And you know what? We want to invite more people into this circle, whether you're a monthly giver or whether it's a one-time gift. There's something I want to do for you. No matter what your first gift's amount is, it does not matter. We want to give you one month free subscription yeah, to, to the, the vault, vault, which is my entire archive of preaching since the early 90s. That's a lot of preaching. That's a lot. <laughs> Being digitally remastered right there for you. Maybe something you want to continue doing later, but for one month, it's free for any amount that God lays on your heart to give as a first time giver. Yeah, it's so cool to be a part of that vault because it, no matter what you're going through at any particular time in your in life, there. if you say, I need a sermon on marriage, you, you just search it 
all of the sermons come up. I need a sermon on uh, prosperity. I need a sermon on faith. peace or faith. Whatever it is, we have got you covered. This guy has been preaching a long time. We've You're been dating in, me. Yeah, we've been in ministry 33 years, been married 33 years. And, you know, there may be people listening who say, man, this is fresh revelation to me. Come on, join us as a covenant partner. Get that free vault and it's going to open up your world. You know what? We want to get back to this word. We hope that you're enjoying it and being impacted by it. Now, without any further ado, let's go back to the word. I'm believing God to do this and I'm believing God to do that. But the fact is, we believe it, but we don't ever take action. And so what I'm believing God for, then there needs to be action taken and there needs to be movement in that direction. I want my marriage to be better. I don't like it where it is. We're just surviving and I want my marriage to thrive. Okay. What action are you going to put on the heels of your faith that moves you in that direction? Whew. I feel the Holy God. I can feel this. I can feel the weight of that word. It's a very simplistic word. But the fact is there's people all in this building right now and all over this place online that you got things in your heart that you're faithful with and wishful with and hopeful with, but you've done nothing to move yourself in that direction. So you get frustrated when your faith don't work, but God's frustrated because you hadn't worked your faith. That needs to be tweeted right there. That's a tweetable moment. <coughs> Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. <clears throat> Stay with me on this now. Evidently, Pilate, who was known for his hard-heartedness, had killed some Galileans who were working and offering, who, who were, excuse me, worshiping and offering sacrifices to God. There's not a lot of history here. There's not a lot of time spent on it. But Jesus is referring to some action that has been taken against some God-fearing Galileans. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the subject he goes into. So this is a springboard into his subject. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus answered said, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That's good. Stay right there. Or those... Are those 18 of whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwelled in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then he spoke a parable. Repentance is the Siamese twin of truth. Because when grace comes, okay, grace and salvation is a decision. The fact that you have believed in your heart and confessed Jesus and you believe he's the son of God does not really mean you've repented. It means you've been forgiven. The Bible says godly sorrow worketh repentance. The people who are just, you know, kind of making a decision around the altar because their other teenage friends made one. You know, and they're doing it, I might as well do it too. I want to be in the, in the youth group. That's not sorrow. But people who come up broken for the way they have spent their life, regretful of their sins and time lost, and come to God for grace and restoration. He says, that worketh repentance. Repentance is not a prayer. Repentance is change. So he said, all perish unless they change. So you can be saved, but if you don't change, something is always deteriorating in your life. Just because you got saved does not mean your mind has been renewed. Just because you got saved does not mean you have the ability or mindset to change your marriage, change who you are as a person, change your temper, all these things. But godly sorrow worketh change. In other words, your newfound faith, if you really were broken enough when you came to God, it will demand repentance. It will demand change. It will demand works. It will demand grace and truth. My God, I'm preaching this thing. So he spoke this parable. 
A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, look, vineyard, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this tree and find none. Cut it down. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. Go back to the, uh, go back to verse seven, I think it is, maybe verse six, where it says a parable. Yeah, he spoke this parable. <laughs> Some of you understand the grace of God, and you understand God and, the, and Jesus as your shepherd, but you don't know the businessman of God. <laughs> Jesus was not raised in the home of a preacher. John the Baptist, his father was a priest, and he was a forerunner of Jesus, and he announced the coming revival Jesus was going to bring. Jesus brought the revival. John the Baptist, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. The he said the revival's coming. Jesus came and brought it. He was raised, John the Baptist, in the home of a preacher. Jesus was raised in the home of a businessman. 2% of Christians get paid by the church. 98% get paid in the marketplace. The people are, that are going to bring a revival are not going to be on stages. The people that are going to be on revival are the people that God has put behind enemy lines, the world, and you're going to bring a great wealth transfer into the kingdom. You're going to bring souls into the kingdom. That is the way the kingdom is supposed to work. We are kings and priests unto our God. Those on a stage, 2% have a priestly anointing, but those in the marketplace, kings have a kingly anointing, and it's the kings that have to bring about the revival. Hallelujah. The prophets prophesy, the priests foretell, but the kings bring it. And you who work in the marketplace, you are the ones that will bring a revival. The only thing I can do is give them hope and foretell, but you will be the ones that demonstrate it with souls and with the world's wealth. So he comes back here and he says, a certain man had a fig tree and he's coming to hold it accountable. I tell people that I have a very difficult job. When a church becomes large and has many moving parts, there is a dynamic that takes place that people who, you know, have smaller churches usually don't deal with. I know that until my dad got to be state overseers and a regional guy and a general overseer, he didn't have to make a ton of business decisions. He got to be pastor all the time. But when you have a lot of entities and you have HR and you have you know, CFOs and CEOs and organizational flowcharts and job descriptions and, and bylaws. And when you have all this stuff, that, that the dynamics change. So when I walk into a meeting, I have to figure out which hat am I wearing? Am I wearing my pastor hat or am I wearing my administrative hat? Because I would never as a pastor do what I would do as an administrator and I would never as an administrator do what I need to do as a pastor. If you are coming here and drugs has ravaged your life and you've lost custody of your kids and your wife has told you to leave and get out of here and you come seeking God, this church will bend over backwards in some way or another to try to bring your life full circle and see God put your world back together. We'll do anything we can. That's when we wear our pastor cap. But if I hired you to do data entry, you got to type. And I have to hold you accountable in that because God's resources have to be maximized. And there's a lot of people that think, if I could just ever get a job at the church, we speak in tongues all the time. Uh, no, we work at this church. <laughs> Somebody say amen to that. Now, God holds accountable. To those of you that are just the grace people, here comes truth. For those of you that are just the faith people, here comes the works. 
He comes back to hold the tree accountable because he has made a significant investment. God will hold you accountable with what you've been given. This is going to sting a little bit, but I need to tell some people. There have been those, some of us are just chronic complainers, chronic complainers. And you need to know right now there are people who have less and have done more. There are people who've had worse treatment and worse lives but complain less. What are you doing with what he's given you? If you have been given a gift by God, I don't care. Well, you know what? I just want to season it the church where I don't have to do anything. If you have been given a gift, you will be held accountable with what you did with that gift. Thank you again for sharing this time with us. But before we go, listen, if you don't know Jesus, it's the greatest decision that you will ever make in your life. And it's simple. It's easy. It's a gift. It's free. He died for you. He loves you. And you know what? He wants you to have an amazing life. Why don't you ask him into your heart today to be your Lord and Savior and start this journey today. Ron, why don't you lead them in prayer? If you don't know Jesus, pray this prayer with me. And I, you don't have to repeat it, but I'm letting you know the things that need to be said to enter into this relationship with Jesus. Pray this kind of prayer. Say, I thank you, Jesus, for your power to save. Yes. I thank you that you came to save me. And I thank you that you died and rose on the third day to purchase my salvation. I accept that gift. I ask you to wash me clean, cleanse me of my sins, help me wash away my past, give me a brand new tomorrow. Come live in me from this moment forward and be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. And just like that, yeah. He comes and lives in your heart. And now this is the decision from which so many other wonderful things will flow. You know what? We are so grateful for the time that we've had with you. So tell somebody about the telecast. Tell somebody and have them watch with you next time. And until then, God, God bless, bless you. you. Wise people can move from number one to number two. They know what God wants and they know how to set a course. For every vision, there is a vehicle. So what vehicle do you have to build to fulfill your purpose? Depending on the assignment on your life, things you get approached with might not be wrong, but are they wise for you to get involved in? In this teaching, Wisdom Society, Ron Carpenter will share with you how to gain knowledge beyond your years. See, God never calls you by what you are. God never calls you by what you used to be. That's people that do that. He comes in and speaks to your future, and that future begins to give you a framework of who you can be. Somebody shout if you know there's more. This series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now, and we will include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call 1-888-259-8200. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen.